everyone. Welcome to D Infinity Live Volume 4, the multi platform, multi publisher show here to inform and entertain you. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our guest hosts. Of course, I am Robert Grimmer from Houston, Texas. I would like to welcome Will Thrasher. Will, good evening, sir. All right. I'd also like to welcome Richard Balsley. Good evening, Richard. Hi. And lastly, Michael Varhola. Good evening, Mike. Good evening. So uh, let's let's get started. We're going to get started uh, tonight with a question from our audience. If you would like to uh, leave us a question, uh, you can tweet us at D Infinity Live, all one word. You can also email us at D Infinity Live at gmail dot com uh, with your questions for uh, us to answer. We're always glad to hear from our fans, so uh, please let us know. But we do have a question tonight. We're going to open this up for everybody to talk about. This is kind of the uh, the elephant in the room of the nerd world. But the question comes from Todd, and he says, what are you guys' opinion on Disney buying Lucasfilm? So I think this is probably the biggest piece of news that's come out uh, lately. Uh, what about you, Mike? Uh, what's, what's your opinion on this, uh, this huge merger? You know, I saw the first Star Wars film when it came out, when I was a kid. I saw it in the theater. Uh, I've seen every single one of the other movies uh, since it came out uh, in the theater, uh, and I liked them all. Uh, I even liked uh, the ones with Jar Jar Binks that everybody got upset about. Uh, the movies are certainly not even. Uh, they certainly had some elements that I didn't like, like the aforementioned character. Uh, but to me, they've all been perfectly fine movies, but they're not sacred. They're not sacred properties. Uh, they're intellectual properties. They're intellectual properties that were owned by one company, and now they've been sold to another company. And uh, the only question in my mind is, I it will uh, the products that come out of the franchise now be better or worse? But it's not like uh, you know uh, the the Catholic Church uh, being bought by the Mormon Church, and now everyone's like, oh my God, what's going to happen? No, it's 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 uh, one set of movies that are perfectly fine, serviceable movies. With their limitations. I mean, my God, as an adult, uh, watching uh, the dialogue between Han Solo and Princess Leia in Empire Strikes Back, it's just embarrassing. It's really some of the worst stuff I've ever seen on the screen. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I don't have any kind of a problem with the buyout at all uh, because, honestly, there are going to be some fans that agitate, but I don't see this really making a big difference for the vast majority of fans. If there's one thing Disney knows how to do. It's please 90% of the people, 90% of the time, uh, and I suspect uh, that whatever comes out is, is going to be as good or better as what we've already seen. Yeah, and we we we've seen during uh, this this week's news cycle that uh, you know we're going to have a new Star Wars movie that uh, that Harrison Ford and and uh, 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 Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill are all both both on board. They're ready to go. Uh, so uh, it, it it seems like uh, Episode Seven is in the tubes. We're ready to get it. Uh, you know, I I wrote about this uh, the day of the news on this on the Skirmisher blog. If you check out uh, skirmisher dot com uh, and click on Yellow Dragon Lair. Um, I wrote about it, and, and my initial opinions were more or less positive. You know, I, I I think the biggest problem with the Star Wars franchise has been George Lucas. I think George Lucas is the problem. George Lucas is a terrible writer. He's a terrible director. He he, he just he just doesn't have the chops. He's a great world builder. He's uh -huh. good at world building, but he's no good at the other parts. And so I think I think that's franchise in spite of him. Right, exactly. Star Wars has succeeded in spite of George Lucas. But George Lucas himself has a great way of making worlds, and I think that world is now going to be in, in the hands of people that can do something good. And if I don't get the, the theatrical edition of Star Wars Trilogy on DVD, I'm going to be very angry. So that's, that's pretty much my, my biggest opinion. What about you, Will? Uh, you, you've heard all this news. Uh, what was your initial thoughts? Well, actually, I, I have spent so much time talking about this because I also do a podcast with my friend Matt Shergi, the sequel cast, uh, where we review films in a franchise, one movie in a t at a time. And we were going to record uh, last week a special episode about holidays. And an hour before we started recording, the news about Star Wars broke. So we decided to ditch that. And we had an hour-long conversation of it. But I guess my, my stance on it boiled, boiled down is I like Star Wars but I am so tired of Star Wars. 
and while I, I certainly want to see a good Star Wars movie uh, come out of all this, and if a good Star Wars movie comes out of it, you know, I will certainly celebrate it. I will, you know, buy the DVDs. I just, I'm so exhausted by the merchandising and the comics and the video games and the tie-ins and all these things that, regrettably, I think have diluted Star Wars. That I, I, I just hope I have the energy to to recognize this a good movie if it comes about. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of the biggest fear that most people are look, are worried about is what is seven, eight, nine going to be like? Are we going to see you know these old guys coming back and and telling a story, or are we going to go off on a new branch? But I think you make a good point there about uh, yeah. uh, being tired because it's not just the movies. If it was just those six movies, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But when you have comics and cartoons and holiday specials and <laughs> and, and, and glass mugs from Burger King. You know, you know, over and over and over and over and over again, it, it does get tiring. Uh, do you feel the same way, Richard, or do you have a... Um, uh, I'm kind of, um, uh, I guess you could say ambivalent about this. Uh, I have a real issue with Disney. I mean, I've written papers about this, and I've taken a lot of flack from people because of my stance on it, and I really do not like most of what they do for the, the main reason is because they think they own myths. You know, I mean, they think they own sacred stories. And so buying Star Wars, you know, is almost like them, you know, winning the argument that, yes, they do own sacred stories. And that really bugs the hell out of me, <laughs> you know, for a lot of reasons. I mean, one of the papers I wrote in school, I mean, this is like the very beginning of, um, of my college career was about this very issue. You know, or not so much Star Wars, but how Disney tries to, like, act like they own these things. You know, and, like, they, they really uh, have some uh, shady things in terms of how their moody, movies are built. You know, especially the animated films, which end up with, you know, these, uh, you know, princesses who run around singing songs and waiting for some guy to come and save them. You know, and if you look at the original stories, that's not what the stories were about. They were about women learning how to grow up and be women. Right, you know, these are stories about you know, like what they're ultimately supposed to do to overcome the social fabric that they they grew up in, and you know, then you have the same thing with the boys. You know, it's like you have to learn how to be responsible. The girls learn to be responsible, and they're supposed to learn how to take care of the house and you know what domestic roles and all this other stuff, you know, because they're products of their time. So you got to keep that in mind. So a lot of the Disney films have been based around this, but they add music to it, and then they like keep changing copyright laws so they don't have to, you know, these don't go into the public domain. That's right. And then these films end up being like, you know, you know, like profited on time and time again, which is pretty much what Star Wars has been doing for years on end. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about making the myth; it's about selling the myth. I mean, it's almost like. You know, I'm probably going to get some flack for saying this, but it's almost like the way religion is, has been profaned. And, you know, selling, selling, you know, one version of Christianity over another. You know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And here you have the same thing happening with these films, right? So anyway, you end up with these, these girls who sing, you know, some version of Someday My Prince Will Come. And then you have the movies of the boys. Instead of learning to be responsible, they screw off the entire movie and uh, do whatever the hell they feel like it, only to find out in the end that, uh, oh, they were on the right path in the first place. Really? In what, <laughs> in what reality does this actually happen? Right. Well, and then and there are some funny politics too, Richard. I mean, oh, I always no. agree with that. Yeah, I know that, and this I mean, this ties into what in in the, in the that um what my argument came out is that you have all these disappointed, pissed off princesses and and these Peter Pans who don't grow up, and you look at the, the commercials on TV, buy this truck and you'll get you know and you'll be a man, drink this beer and you'll get all these uh, hot women well, just that, hanging all over. Then you. we learned from the Lion King that. Well, actually, according to the circle of life, 99% of us are food product for the upper 1%, and we're <laughs> supposed to sing and be happy about that. That's, that's actually very profoundly disturbing, that when the new king is born, we're supposed to bend our necks so that he can pick whichever one of us he wants and eats us. That is not uh, uh, American uh, progressive politics by yeah. any means. 
And yet a whole generation of kids were, were raised believing, oh, when the new king is born, I'm supposed to bow my neck because uh, the circle of life is that uh, uh, most of us just get eaten. That's, I, I find that very disturbing. And Will that this have is, an impact on Star Wars? I don't know. Yeah, and you know, and this is essentially the problem that I have with the, the merger. I mean, they, they've been good with the Marvel products so far. Keeping my finger, fingers crossed for that, but I'm not holding my breath that it's going to stay that way because I'm just waiting for Iron Man the musical to come out at some point. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they did it with Spider Man, so why not try it with something else, right? It'll probably be Thor's the Poppin, actually. Yeah, I, but you know, so that's that's why I'm kind of ambivalent on this issue. I mean, it's it's like it's really it's like where are they going to try to milk the more you know more money out of it now? Okay, well, well here here's. Here's a curveball. What if we got Joss Whedon's Star Wars? Uh, you mean where it was essentially Star Wars, but they all wore dusters and cowboy hats? <laughs> yeah, really fucking stupid. That would keep me from watching it, that's for sure. Sounds like a, a, a mashup of uh, Star Wars and Serenity well, or that's something. that's what I'm saying. Who needs that? Mal Solo. <laughs> Well, I, I'm really excited about the merger. Uh, you know, I, I like I said earlier, I've, I've always felt that Lucas has been the problem. Uh, and now that Lucas is out of the picture, uh, we only basically have his notes and his world. And I, I think that's what Lucas does well. Um, you know, uh, the, the other interesting note that I have about this is that uh, Lucas bought, uh, or excuse me, Disney bought the uh, Lucasfilm for $4 billion, roughly. Uh, and Lucas decided to give all that money away to charity. Just poof, it's gone. Now, I know he's made buckets of money over the years from Star Wars, so it, so it may not be a big deal. But it, it, it changed my opinion on, on, on Lucas. I mean, I still don't think he's a, a, a good writer or director, but I no longer have this vitriol about it. And it kind of reminds me of the same way uh, Bill Gates did, you know, all that vitriol about Bill Gates in the late 80s and 90s, and then he gives away billions of dollars to charity. That's a good to make point. It certainly, it certainly speaks to motive. Right. And I think that's a, that's 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 an important part of the story. I think is that you know he he essentially just gave it away to charity, and I think that's a that's a pretty uh, yeah. a pretty strong message. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean that, so, that well, part. Uh, yeah. I was gonna say that part. No, ahead, I have Richard. no problem with. It's just mm -hmm. it, it's Disney's track record. I mean that that's really why I said the things that I did. And they've done so, good with Pixar. You know, I mean, all the later Pixar movies, early Pixar movies are great too, don't get me wrong, but the later Pixar movies have held up very well. Well, I guess I'm of a like mind with Richard, which is to say, from a technical point of view, I have no doubt that they'll execute uh, this uh, perfectly. It's from a philosophical point of view that the content of what they're executing so perfectly might be uh, questionable. Right. Uh, well, the, you know, that's. I think that's enough we can can talk about that uh, quite a bit more, but I think that's enough for a gaming show that we've talked about, uh, uh, Disney and Lucasfilm. But uh, I, I am excited about the new movie. I will be going to see it in theaters, just like I've seen all the other ones before. And I'll probably be disappointed, I realize that too. But uh, let's move on to gaming news. Uh, of course, uh, in the United States uh, this past Tuesday, uh, we had our election day, where uh, lots of us went out and voted for our, our president and uh, various other uh, seats around the nation. But there was one. Wait, that was this Tuesday. That, that was this Tuesday. Will. <laughs> oh, Sorry, son of a man! <laughs> <laughs> so we we focused on one uh, one story on episode two, and I'll have a link in the underbar down there. Uh, we focused on a story from Maine uh, by uh, by a lady named Colleen Lockowitz. And just to quickly uh, to fill you in, Colleen is a World of Warcraft player uh, who is part of a guild that's attached to the Daily Kos, a, a very left wing blog. Um, and uh, she was uh, also running for state senator in Maine in the 25th district. Uh, and her opponents in the Maine Republican Party had uh, created this attack blog that used uh, her uh, discussions on the Daily Kos board as, as uh, a reason why she wasn't fit 
to lead. Uh, but this past Tuesday, uh, Colleen beat her opponent uh, very soundly by nearly 10 points uh, and uh, picked up a seat for the Democrats in the state house. Uh, I, and I, th I think this is uh, this is pretty telling, guys. You know, um, yeah. uh, Colleen got lots of support from all over the world after the the story went viral, and which helped her. I think helped propel her. So, uh, so is this a mandate against this sort of thing? Uh, do do political parties are they going to have to stop uh, stop using this sort of uh, false attacks? What do you think, Mike? Uh, I think that it is not a specific mandate against it in the case of Lakowitz. Uh, I think it's a mandate against this sort of thing uh, in general. Uh, we're looking at the kind of money, for example, that Karl Rove spent on behalf of the Republican uh, cause in this last election, and it turns out none of the people they supported with, with their billions of dollars actually won. Uh, so I would say that the American people have rejected, not all of them, uh, clearly, as, as correspondence I've been getting from my, my uh, right-wing relatives over the past couple days has indicated, uh, but I would say that the American people have sort of said, oh yeah, we don't want to have anything to do with this. You spend a billion dollars uh, spreading hate and lies, and you can't get one person elected with it. Uh, I would say that there is, there is a mandate, at least implicit in that, sort of like a reverse mandate. Not a mandate of this is what we'll do, but a mandate of this is at least what we'll reject. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, I don't. I don't think this kind of like digging up dirt and using it in a campaign and using you know quotes and stuff out of context. I I don't think that that's going to stop only because there's too many people that respond to it and too many people for whom that's their bread and butter. Uh, that being said, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad she won and, and, you know, I, you know, hopefully, you know, she'll, she'll, she'll represent for the gamer crowd. Yeah, it seems like uh, gamer gamers are having a much higher profile. Of course, we talked about on episode two about uh, Sean Spence and uh, if, the, who died in the the Benghazi Libya attack, who was an Eve Online player. Um, right. I also read about this weekend that there was a a person who was part of the Catan Settlers of Catan World Championship, who was running for a a school board uh, champ, a school board place in his hometown, uh, who won this week. So cool. you know, I. I I think gamers as a whole, we, we're just people. We're like anybody else, and and trying to bring up our hobbies as something that uh, is a negative thing, I think, is just uh, we're all not just, bearded middle-aged slobs, right? Not oh. all of us. Wait. <laughs> Wait. So uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that, that's all I wanted to say about Colleen. I just want to congratulate her. Uh, uh, we did try to get her on the show uh, uh, back on the second episode. I, I am going to try to see if I can get her on a future uh, episode to talk with us about gaming. Say again, Mike? That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we would love to have her. So uh, uh, if she's watching, please come join us, and uh, we, we'd love to have a great <laughs> conversation with you about, uh, about uh, what you went through and, and your campaign. Pain. Uh, just want to remind everyone to make sure to click the subscribe button right up there. I should be pointing close to it. Make sure to click the subscribe button. That'll that helps us so much. Uh, to have each and every one of our viewers subscribe to the channel uh, helps get the word out to YouTube. Also, if you'd like, please click the like button down there on the bottom. You'll see uh, you'll see that there. Again, that also helps us so much uh, in uh, in getting the word out for everyone. Uh, so our so our next topic tonight is Kickstarter. This is going to be, I'm sure, the the bread and butter of tonight's show. Uh, Kickstarter has been a huge huge, huge thing for the gaming community. Uh, just a few years ago, there was less than $5 million spent on the entire gaming category. And now there's something to the tune of $60 million a year spent. I think this is a, a huge thing. Yep. Uh, you have uh, Reaper involved. You have mm -hmm. Steve Jackson Games involved. You have all these huge companies, you have small companies that are getting involved left and right and are do, having huge, huge Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. So I think this is, again, like we talked about with the Disney, this is kind of the elephant in the room for the gaming community, as this is where the funding is coming. So, so Mike, 
Nick, you've uh, you you ran a Kickstarter for for Skirmisher for the Swords of Coast campaign setting. Uh, tell us a little about uh, what what you had to go through to to create it and and uh, market it, uh, and give us kind of an idea of what uh, what you had to go through for all that. Well, uh, yeah, I'll answer that, and if I could, I'd also like to to identify the three things that I've I've actually. Uh, uh, discovered uh, are the cause of failed Kickstarters uh, because I think what makes them succeed is just as important as what makes them fail and vice versa. Uh, yeah, we did a Kickstarter recently for Skirmisher Publishing. Uh, it was for our Swords of Coast fantasy campaign setting. Uh, and Will is the art director for that project uh, and has already started commissioning some of the great images and maps that are going to be in it. What motivated us to do a Kickstarter with this I, is that it was something we wanted to be so much more lavish than anything we had done before. skirmisher has been around for 10 years. We've got user-friendly, clean, well-laid-out, accessible books, but we really wanted to go above and beyond with the fantasy campaign setting. We wanted to have custom maps and custom illustrations, and we wanted to be able to pay top-notch artists to be able to uh, execute that work for us. So for us, Kickstarter was not a chance to do something different than what we had ever done before. It was a chance to do the same thing we had done before in a bigger and better way. So we ran a, a modest Kickstarter. Uh, we asked for $3,000, and we ended up um, coming out 25% um, uh, at 125% of the funding that we requested. So that's not a million dollar Kickstarter. That's not a fifty thousand dollar Kickstarter. I would have preferred a million dollars or fifty thousand dollars. But you know, we walked away with you know after we had to pay our fees and whatnot. You know, with with more than three thousand dollars that we're using uh, directly uh, to put into the hands of the artists and cartographers who are going to ma be making this a great book. So for us, uh, it was a um, uh, maybe not an ultra dramatic tool, but a very useful functional fundraising tool. Uh, we're going to win. Uh, our readers are going to win. And even people who didn't support us in the Kickstarter are going to get a better product that they can then look at and buy if they choose to. So for us, it was a win win situation. Yeah, and it seems like that's how it is with with most companies that uh, that are able to do these successful. But you said there was three things that you could do that could uh, well, screw up a Kickstarter. What what are those things? Well, you know, uh, I, I will note that the Kickstarter was a labor intensive process, uh, and everybody who's sitting here tonight uh, helped support it to some extent. Uh, I know every single one of you guys helped get out the word and sent out messages to to your friends and and people that you know in the gaming community. It is labor intensive. When you run a Kickstarter, uh, if you want it to succeed, you are managing that Kickstarter every day for 30 days. Um, and the three things I've, I've seen that make Kickstarters fail, uh, one, laziness. Um, you got to send out those updates. And even we weren't necessarily as good with that as we should have. We sent out maybe right. one update every three days, and we were maybe three or four days in before we sent out the first one. It was a learning process for us. But I've seen Kickstarters where 10 days in, two weeks in, they haven't sent out a single update. They haven't sent out updates to the people they want backing their, thanking the people who already backed it, or uh, asking other people to back it and telling them why. So uh, laziness, uh, I would say, is, is the number one death knell for, uh, for a Kickstarter. Uh, it is not free money. Uh, it is not a donation. Uh, when you're asking someone to contribute to your Kickstarter, you're asking them to invest in your vision. And if you're not willing to tell them again and again, articulately and compellingly, why they should do that, they will not. You know, a couple relatives will, a couple friends will, a couple shills will, but uh, mostly they won't. The second thing, greed. Just flat out greed. Uh, I've seen little companies. Skirmisher is a is a modest sized company. We've been around for ten years. I saw companies that I'd never heard of asking for twenty one thousand dollars to launch a product. Why do they want twenty thousand dollars? Because that sounds like a buttload of money, and they thought if they asked for it, people would just give them that money. And and you know the greed and the laziness they go hand in hand. When someone's asking for twenty thousand uh, dollars, they are greedy and they are lazy. And um. I think that greediness and that laziness, that says pretty clearly to customers, 
these people aren't going to make good on their promises. Keep in mind, you're making promises that are unenforceable with a Kickstarter. You can lose customers, you can piss people off, you'll lose a lot of goodwill, it'll ruin you as a company. But there's nothing legally people can do to get their money back once they've given to you. So right. you've got to build faith with a Kickstarter. And when you're greedy and you're lazy, you're not building that faith. So I'd say, I'd say those are the two main things that kill a Kickstarter. And then I was talking to some people at Austin Comic Con a couple of weeks ago, and, and they added a third one that I think is uh, important, and that's uh, obscurity. Uh, if nobody's ever heard of your company, uh, it's going to really decrease the chance that your Kickstarter uh, succeeds. And um, people could say, well, how can I help that? Well, you can help that by, by uh, social networking and building presence on Facebook and building a good website. So uh, greed, laziness, obscurity, those are the three things you have to make sure uh, that your Kickstarter doesn't fall prey to. Well, uh, Actually, if I could uh, no, comment on something. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry about uh, but uh, it, it, where this is where where Kickstarter becomes something of a of a mixed blessing. Mm -hmm. uh, a good number of the gamers I know now will sink more money into potential products on Kickstarter than they will spend at their friendly local game store. And I'm and the thing is that the you know the local the local game store is really I mean our our local game store Amazing Wonders went out of business uh, regrettably at the the end of October and and we're still kind of reeling from that and I you, you lose so when you you lose so much when you lose your local game store and I'm yeah. worried that that's going to be uh, that's going to be uh, just one more thing that's going to get in the way of local game stores are going to be people who who throw a lot of money at, at Kickstarter and not buy good product that already exists. Yeah, and that, that's, that's, that's been a big problem. One of the arguments that I've heard quite a bit in discussions with people on you know various social medias is that uh, lots of people think Kickstarter is turning into a store where people can just uh, buy products that are already out. Um, I think part of... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the board games. Like uh, there was one, uh, Mark Reen Reinhagen uh, did uh, Democracy, which is a board game about democracy and voting and politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was already done. It was already done, already completed. They were just funding it for uh, uh, to to produce the game for the fans. And I, I I think that's an issue. But the other side of that is lots of Kickstarters have retailer level. You know where retailers can get the product. So, did, will do you think that 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 is a um, a good use of Kickstarter is to a allow retailers to buy things in bulk via it? Well, I mean, if if it works out for the retailers and it works out for Kickstarter and it works out for the people uh, the people organizing the Kickstarters, I really don't really have any any problem with that. Um, and I also, you know, I don't really have any problem with people using Kickstarter you know, as as a store. I mean, if if people want to use it as a pre-order service, that's just how they're they're going to use it. I guess my my only, uh, I, I guess my, my again my my only issue is, you know, there there's there's stuff there there's gaming there's good gaming products that's that's out now that I think. Is gonna is getting less support because of because of people going for the next best thing on Kickstarter or the the, the new shiny thing that might be coming down the pipe. Uh, and as far as like you know like a game already being developed, uh, but you know using Kickstarter to get money for like a a bigger print run or a fancier set, uh, I have no problem with that. You know so long as you know so long as you know you're you're fully transparent. Just full disclosure. Tell, part full disclosure. Yeah, yeah. Just you know, tell me what you need the money for. If if the game's already written, you just need money for for a, to to do a hard a, a hard cover, a good physical hard cover edition. You know that that's fine. Just let me know. We've already done the devel the development. We need the money to get this in print so we can ship it out. I'm totally fine with that. And and that is one advantage I do like about Kickstarter. There, I, I do get more transparency from people who who are doing stuff on Kickstarter than I do get from most other uh, most other like 
game publishers or, or content producers in general. Yeah. Uh, with Without Kickstarter, most of these products would be hidden behind layers of non-disclosure agreements, and you'd get a title and a release date, and then eventually it would show up. But I do like that I can follow the development of these things through Kickstarter and, and feel like I'm in more direct content, uh, contact, more direct contact with the creators. Good point. Uh, Kickstarter isn't the only crowdfunding uh, website out there. Of course, there's Indiegogo. Uh, uh, Richard, you uh, you were telling you were showing me uh, a link for a new uh, thing called Gambitious. That's a game only um, crowdsource. Uh, do you think this is going to pull away from Kickstarter for games, or can it can something like this survive on its own? I don't know. I mean, you know, because if you if you divvy up the market too much, you get a saturation point, and then you know you really can't go anywhere. I mean, look at uh, Amazon.com; they really don't have very much in the way of uh, of competition. I mean, the whole, that's one of the reasons why the dot com bubble burst in the first place is. Uh, the internet can only handle so much. It's not not because like bandwidth issues, but the public will only buy from X number of stores online, just like they do when they go out shopping. You know that's why you end up with chain stores in the first place. It's not because they're they're better than a mom and pop shop, but because there are only so many stores people are willing to go to, regardless of what store it may be. So it's kind of hard to say. But one of the problems that I see with Kickstarter is that there's no way to distinguish at this point what kind of game the project is. You know, what is it a video game? Is it a role playing game? A board game? Is it a game for kids? What what is it? You know, you know, so you can't go and find the things that you really are interested in. And so I've seen a few different things. And I think that's why Gambitious was started is because of that. I mean, even though um I'm I'm not sure who the group was, but some of the original people behind uh uh Shadowrun, they mm -hmm. They broke what, like a million or two million? I can't remember what the the record was, but I mean, they broke a million dollars for funding for a, a a video game. And the only reason why you know they they got it, I believe, is because of name recognition more than anything else. Everybody already knew what Shadowrun was, and then when they saw that it was the original people who were attached to this project, that just like boosted it even more. Because here you have the people who made the world working on a new thing for this you know product that's been around for twenty plus years. So that's going to draw more people as it is. And, you know, and like one of the things Mike said, you know. I, I see Kickstarter as kind of like the the digital version of going door to door. You you're really yeah. you're a door to door yeah. salesman. I mean, you have to promote the hell out of your work on Kickstarter. I mean, that's the only way you're going to get noticed. I mean, especially since unlike going door to door, you don't you don't get to look somebody in the eye. They can't really see you or anything like that. So you kind of lose a little bit of the the. Uh, the emotional context, which is why I think so many videos are uh, attached to products you know, or projects that people are doing on Kickstarter because it gives them a way to, to bridge that gap. And, and Will I, made that happen for us. I mean, yeah. Will's the one that really understood that we needed to do that, and he's the one that made it happen. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's and I think that also helps too because like you get basically a free commercial while you're you're trying to get people to to support your project. No, I mean seriously, you don't have to spend money for airtime to try to you know draw people to your Kickstarter thing because it's right there. And you know, like Will was saying, you don't need NDAs or any of this other stuff. Right. You know, and, and all you have is just a. a product title and a you know tentative release date you get to see this thing in action so mm -hmm. you get to see if you really want to back it and i've seen a few products that have been really good be, you know because of that and i mean like there's this one it's called dice rings i don't know if you've seen that it's really oh, yeah. slick i mean their video for their product is really slick and i mean it's filled with a lot of humor that gamers are going to get and so i think it really fits what you need to do for kickstarter and why i think people are running this way is because it's like we have a place now where people can come together and fund things that that they've seen in forums you know on, on different gaming forums it wouldn't be neat if somebody did this well now somebody's actually doing these things 
And I had a very similar experience uh, with the Catan board. I don't know if you've seen mm. seen it or not, but it's a, a plastic molded uh, board that you can put together uh, so that your settlers of Catan pieces don't move around. Yeah. And I think the most interesting thing about it is is that the creators of the Catan board are an independent company. They just they just said, hey, this is an idea that I think is a good thing. You know, we're going to make it. They went to Mayfair. They went to Klaus Stuber. They they you know they they talked to everybody who was involved and and got it got approval and, and did it. And I think I think something like that is great. But I have a, cool. I have a question for each of you, um, and and I'll answer it first. Uh, but uh, how many Kickstarters have you backed? And uh, have you been happy with what you've done? So I, I've done seven, uh, and uh, really the two big ones that I've been real happy with have been the Reaper Bones, which is a 270 minis at like 40 cents a piece, something like that, some, some crazy, crazy deal that they had. Uh, and, the, and the other one that I was real happy about is, is the Catan board. Uh, you know, uh, I, we play Settlers of Catan with, with uh, great regularity around here. Whenever we get three or more people together, we're playing Catan, and we've had many problems with the board shifting around and, and not being able to play on things that weren't really flat so now we can take it around take it to other places take it to the beach take it to the picnic you know and and play play the game so uh, well what about you how many uh, how many kickstarters have you backed and and what were your favorites out of them uh, i've i've backed three uh one of them didn't reach its funding goal uh and the other two have have not sort of reached the deadline for when their product is going to be out so for me it's you know i'm it's still a learning experience and so so far it's you know it's been a good experience uh you know both of them have been you know pretty regular with updates and you know forthcoming with details so i know i have i have lots of confidence that that these uh projects and products are going to move forward but uh, I guess I gotta reserve final judgment until I've actually got right. something in my hand or see something on the shelves. Yeah, and that and that's the trick is I haven't gotten anything in hand yet either. So you know, it's a it's a matter of time before that happens. What about you, Mike? Uh, what, what how many have you backed and and well, uh, have you been happy with the experience so far? Yeah, uh, uh, when I say that I've backed eight. Uh, I mean that Skirmisher Publishing has backed eight. So I, right, I have backed eight. I'm the one that clicked the button and backed them. Uh, but right. I did it in the name of Skirmisher <laughs> Publishing. And we've backed eight of them. And um, uh, I actually haven't seen anything from any of them yet. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this seems to be a theme. But, but uh, it's not to say that I'm suspicious or displeased. Uh, one of the ones I backed was a recreation of art from the original basic and expert D&D books by right. artist Jeff D. And he's one of our Texas artists. He lives up in Austin. Uh, and he's, I mean, he's a great guy and he's a great artist. So I wanted to back that for nostalgia purposes, uh, if nothing else, because I loved his art. So I backed Jeff D. Uh, there's a, um, a Wild West game uh, that uh, has got a Kickstarter going on called Coffins and Tombstones. And one of the artists for that is uh, one of our artists, Amanda Cole. So I backed that because... She's a she's a great artist. Uh, I know she's a great artist sure. because we've contracted her to do art for us. Uh, so so those are a couple of the ones I've done. But we've done eight uh, back eight as a company because there were things that specific things we liked about what they were doing, uh, or because we had some kind of a, a also had a a personal connection to them. Uh, two of the eight, two or three of the eight, never got funded. Right. They, they they failed, so you know we didn't end up having to pay on them, and of course we never got anything on them. But we had faith in them. If the people ever relaunch them, we'll we'll back them again. Um, and then the others are all in progress, so so we haven't gotten anything yet. But I would say that that uh, I have, I have nothing to be unpleased about. Uh, I feel just as good about them as as one would back them. And you got to back these things if you want people to back you. You've got to be part of this community. Um, the day a Kickstarter starts. Every dollar you get is worth more than a dollar on that first day. So I'll just say this to anybody. If you're going to back a Kickstarter for someone, you know, I didn't want to chastise my friends who came in on day 29 and said, oh, you asked me to pledge a dollar. Here's a dollar. Who gives a shit? Your dollar on day 29 does me no good whatsoever. None. Uh, I Either I am going to make it or I'm not going to make it. But your one dollar on day one gets me a backer, starts building faith and confidence in my Kickstarter. Your dollar is worth immeasurable amounts more than one dollar on day one. 
I, day 30, it's not worth anything because either I'm going to get back or I'm not. So a dollar is worth more than a dollar on day one. It's worth less than a dollar on day 30. Uh, so if you're going to back these things, back them early. So, uh, and that's what we've done with ours. When I see that a friend or an associate or someone we care about is doing a, a Kickstarter, we back them right away. If not for a lot, then, then, then quickly. Right. And you know, that's, that's what I've done. One of the, the Kickstarters I backed was uh, Andy Hopp's uh, miniatures line for, for the low, the low life the miniatures. That's the I backed, too. <laughs> Right, and I and I couldn't put in much, so I only put in five bucks. I won't get anything out of it except uh, maybe a little recognition. But I was able to support him on day one and say, "Hey, here you go. This is this is what I'm doing." So, yep. uh, yeah, I think that's a very important point. If if there's something you like, get in early, spread the word. And that's that's a that's a really valid point. What about you, Richard? Uh, how many have you supported, and uh, what uh, have you gotten anything yet? Oh yeah, I, I see. Um trying to remember all the ones that I've backed. I think I've backed four and they've all been successful. Unfortunately, most of the ones that I've backed have only been for a couple of dollars or so, um, which included the D&D &D documentary. I know not everybody's happy with that, but um, I did that because I thought it was, a, if nothing else, it was an interesting issue. You know, something to be done. I'm not sure how well sure. this is going to show up because the paper is shiny. But I backed the Dungeon oh, Morph good. dice, and this is. Um, let's see. Hold it back here. No, it looks good when you had it up close. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Th these are actually the 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 sheets that I got for the dice themselves. Like it tells me like what the dice are for because the dice themselves just have a letter on them. You know, so they couldn't print what it was since. I mean, that's the faces of the dice. Uh, and so um, Inkwell Ideas came up with this concept of doing these dungeon morph dice. And uh, so they ended up doing, what, 15 different dice. So like six times uh, five, so 30, 90 different faces, you know, of, of you know, like you roll a random dungeon, you know. So it's kind of like uh, some of the dungeon, uh, you know, random dungeon dice that I've seen out there. But uh, they, these, I thought, were a really good idea because instead of just being like a corridor and then you determine however long you wanted it, this was a like, fully realized concept on, on a die of like, well, here's a room. Like, I mean, try to get this up close so you can see it. I mean, that's how detailed – these are supposed to be caves, you know, right. and that's we'll, pretty we'll detailed. Let's bastardize this idea. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so yeah, I backed that, and uh, I backed uh, three other projects, and I, I guess I have a really good track record because everything that I've backed has uh, actually been funded. Can, can, yeah. I, uh, can I interject something, sure. Bob? Go ahead, um, Mike. One thing that I've heard a number of people say is, "Well, I only backed it for five bucks, so I'm not going to get anything. I backed it for two bucks, I'm not going to get anything." I will say this: that when Skirmisher ran its Kickstarter, we were sensitive to wanting to make sure everybody got something. Skirmisher has a product line called Cardstock Characters. They're essentially paper miniatures, full-color paper miniatures, all done by artists. None of this hideous-looking, uh, uh, you know, I don't even know what you'd call it, Will, but this crap that people draw online. It's all the, the, real art done by... poser real art. art. Yeah, poser art, right. This is our, our artists are not posers. They're real artists. But everybody who, who contributed at least $1 to Skirmisher's Kickstarter is getting 7 custom cardstock miniatures. If you contributed one dollar to our Kickstarter, you get seven cardstock character miniatures that you can use in your game. So everybody is so so nobody can say, well I only contributed a dollar to the uh, to the skirmisher uh, Kickstarter. And I think that's important. Uh, we can say now, oh you contributed a dollar to us. You got seven miniatures you could use in your game. Now we've only got two of them done and we've only sent two of them out. We're doing that over an incremental period. But by the time we release the product that, that we did the Kickstarter for, people will have those seven minis. So, so I think right. that's, a, that's an important thing for a Kickstarter. Just thanking people, if they, they contribute a buck is fine, but I, I'm not going to begrudge anyone that. I wanted to do better. And, and Will and I, uh, Will really helped uh, uh, guide uh, that. Uh, we wanted to do better, and we did. So. Yeah, and uh, the, the, one of the beautiful things about a live show is we get information from uh, the audience. Uh, uh, Diana, one of our uh, regular re readers, our listeners, uh, uh, corrected Lopez? me. Yes, that that's Lopez? correct. She, she's yep. just not a regular listener. She's a gun mall. 
Uh, yeah, she's a she's a huge fan. Uh, she corrected me. Uh, in 2012, games on Kickstarter went from the uh, went from the eighth most funded category to the second most funded. In 2009, there was less than fifty thousand dollars, and in 2012, there was fifty million in the games category. Hmm. So Good that is Lord. a huge, huge uh, amount of money that uh, that Kickstarter. So thank you, Diana. And remember, if anybody wants to interact with us, you can do so on YouTube, which is where uh, Diana was interacting. You can interact with us on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, all that information will be on the doobly-doo below. Um, so uh, we're going to move on from Kickstarter and talk about our last topic of the night. Uh, we're going to talk about AetherCon. AetherCon.com. Uh, AetherCon. Sorry, I'm going to screw that up every time. EtherCon. EtherCon is a, uh, a, a an internet-based gaming convention. It's everything that uh, that you uh, like and love about uh, gaming conventions. Uh, there's a vendors hall. There's tournaments. There's open gaming. Uh, there is uh, there's lots of great things. Uh, I think all of us are uh, at least running games during the show. Skirmisher is going to have a big presence. The Infinity yep. is going to have a big presence. Um, yep. uh, Mike, you have a lot of details. Uh, can you fill us in a little bit about, uh, first, what AetherCon is and what we're going to be doing at the show? Yeah, I, I mean, the AetherCon is new to me in a lot of ways. Uh, I've never done a, an online con before. Uh, you know, a lot of the kind of stuff we're doing now uh, through the Google Hangouts and on YouTube is going to be the you know the kind of technology engine that's behind it. But uh, we're going to have a virtual booth. You're running that, Rob. Yep. Um, I'm going to be running uh, on a couple of panels, uh, talking about things like uh, you know what are hit points. You know that's a good philosophical question for the game. And we've got some medical professionals associated with Skirmisher who are coming on and, and being part of that. Um, I think all of us sitting here are running games. I think Will is uh, running. What, Will, you're running three Call of Cthulhu scenarios? It was uh, the uh, Broken Sky, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Richard is running a scenario tying in with his Swords of Coast Hecaton uh, anthology story, uh, Chasing Shadows, which is about a beast stalking some people. Uh, I'm running um, some tying in with Swords of Coast Necropolis, so we're really pushing our whole Swords of Coast line. And I think you're doing a scenario for it, aren't you, Rob? Yeah, no. I'm doing I'm doing the very first public uh, play test of the Farces of Darkness Pathfinder edition. Uh, nice. About an evil party, uh, yeah. right? Exactly. So so yeah, uh, uh, we're we're uh, running a number of events. We're running a booth. We're participating in panels, and we are providing uh, the highest level of prize support of any company involved. Uh, and I know that. Uh, because when I went to the people who were running it, I said, we'd like to provide prize support. Uh, how much should we provide? And they hemmed and hawed, and I said, what is the most that is being provided for you now? And they refused to tell us, and I said, you know, you guys are not very good negotiators. If you tell me how much the most is being provided by another company, I will provide more from both Skirmisher and the Infinity. So Skirmisher is providing the highest amount uh, of any backer for EtherCon in prize support, and D-Infinity matched that. So uh, we are each providing an equal amount, which is greater than any of the other sponsors involved. So that, so uh, we're, we're in neck deep with it, uh, <laughs> and obviously uh, wanted to succeed. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a new and innovative thing, and um, um, we're going to make a go of it. And uh, it, it's a very compelling concept. Uh, because basically, uh, you don't have to get just people who can physically travel uh, to a certain location. People who can't afford that or are not inclined to or don't have the time or, or whatever uh, can still be part of this. So, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a bold concept, and, and we're going to do everything we can to support it. Uh, during uh, Gen Con, there was a um, kind of a parallel convention that used Google Plus Hangouts to do uh, games and panels and things like that amongst the community. So, and it had two or three thousand people involved in it. You know, so there there was quite a quite a few. So, I, I have high hopes for AetherCon. Uh, Richard, I have a question for you, sir. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've been to gaming conventions in the real world. Uh, aside from uh, aside from uh, the lack of a funky gamer. Uh, do you see any uh, uh, positives to doing a, an online uh, convention like this? Well, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things that I thought it's really great. Um, 
like Mike said, you don't have to go anywhere. That's the best part for me. It was just you're there. I mean, wherever you are, you're there. I mean, it's I mean, it's kind of funny. It's almost like the what the the uh, Buddhist uh, proverb, you know, wherever you are, that's where you are, kind of thing. Um, but you know, it's it's kind of cool that you get to actually chat with people depending on how the the tables are run you might have a uh, video with with people or not so i mean you don't if if you know like the the whole stereotypical uh, gamer concept uh, is you know turns you off you don't have to use any video so you know you're you're free from that you could just focus on the board um as for the the software itself that's running it i thought that's kind of interesting you know like the way it's set up you know, it's a it's a really neat uh, concept. So, you know, I'm looking forward to, yeah. to doing stuff with it. But I mean, as far as going to a gaming convention, the only thing that 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 might not be quite as good is that you you don't really get to interact with people you know, who show up to your game. And uh, you know, a couple of times that I've run games, uh, I've actually had you know people you know thank me afterwards or even want to shake mm -hmm. my hand. I mean, you can't do that with the online thing, but it's really great that you don't have to worry about the the cost of getting there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the the, uh, the 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 differences you know offset each other enough that, that I think it's a really promising idea. Right, and I and I think it'll be a great time. Uh, we're all going to be involved uh, in one way or the other. Uh, you can catch it uh, at ethercon.com. We'll have a link below, uh, so you can make sure and check that. It's November sixteenth through eighteenth. Uh, come sign up for our games. Uh, we'd love to love to have uh, our fans come on and play and uh, see see what we're all about. So uh, we're going to wrap it up for tonight, uh, but we do want to give everybody a chance to have a last word. So we'll start with Will Thrasher. Will Thrasher, your last word for the evening. Uh, my last word, uh, I've, I've been going through sort of a, a personal gaming drought, so I'm just going to advise all of our listeners to, to game whenever you can, however you can. <laughs> That is an excellent last word. Uh, my last word for the evening is to congratulate Colleen Lakowitz and on top of that the American people for going out and voting and, and uh, electing, uh, electing people that, that you either like or don't like, but you're using your, uh, uh, using your liberty, and I, I really appreciate that. And I thank everyone who voted. Uh, and, again, congratulations to Colleen. We hope to have her on the show at some point in the future. Uh, Richard, your last word, kind sir. Uh just uh, plugging away on some new stuff for for skirmisher, like my blog and other things, and uh, I'm hoping that it'll come. You know, some of these things will come out in a couple of weeks or so, and I'm keeping them under wraps for now, mostly <laughs> so I can build some suspense. Yes, <laughs> but you know, just let people know that I have some stuff I'm working on. Awesome. Well, we'll look forward to that uh, hopefully soon. And Mike, uh, you're the last, the last, last word of the evening. What is your last word, sir? Last word. Uh, yeah, uh, my last, last word is maybe a, a little off topic, but it, it ties in with uh, things that uh, cross over into the gaming world. Uh, some of our listeners might know that I'm the author of two travel guides that are part of the America's Haunted Road Trip series. So these are travel guides to haunted places that people can visit. And I wrote two of the, the books in the series, um, Ghost Hunting Virginia and Ghost Hunting Maryland. And I learned this week that I will be taking over as the editor of the America's Haunted Road Trip series. Oh, I will be oh congratulations. More than line of books. I just learned that. Cool. So um, uh, that's something that um, uh, may actually have an impact on some of Skirmisher's uh, game development because uh, I've got a lot of contacts in uh, you know the ghost hunting community, and there is crossover into gaming, maybe not so much role playing, but things like board games and card games. And uh, I'm really thinking that, um, you know, I'd like to hear what Will thinks of this, too. I'm really thinking that, that we might want to take some of our experience as ghost hunters or our uh, uh, background or knowledge of that uh, particular phenomena and uh, see what kind of a game we could develop out of it. Uh, if nothing else, then just, you know, maybe a Monopoly-style board game where you visit different haunted sites around the country. But, but uh, that's, that's my last word, that I'm taking over as Clarice Press's uh, series editor for the uh, America's Haunted Road Trip series. Well, that, that's great news, Mike. Congratulations, sir. I know that that's a uh, that's a great feather in your cap, and uh, I know how well liked you are in the paranormal community. So, uh, uh, good job. Glad glad to hear that great news. 
Uh, so that'll that'll do it for us for tonight. I uh, want to thank uh, Will Thrasher, Richard Walsley, Michael Varhola. Uh, in two weeks, actually 13 days, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we'll be having our next show. That's that's uh, not our normal day. It'll be at a normal time, 8 p.m., and we will have uh, D-Infinity and Skirmishers IT man, uh, uh Name Brendan, Cass. Brendan Cass. Brendan Cass. Thank you very much. We'll have Brendan Cass on the show, uh, who has a great announcement for uh, for D Infinity, uh, and we're looking forward to telling you guys about it. Uh, so uh, remember, subscribe, like. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Robert Groover. Good night and thank you. <laughs>